All right, greetings everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, fourth in the series of a, a new test run of what we're doing with uh, UC Cooperative Extension and Ag and Natural Resources. It's Community Economic Development Innovations for a Post-Pandemic Economy it's a Spotlight Series. And we've been doing this every other week. Uh, we'll have another one coming up here in two weeks. It'll be the final for this particular series and we'll be relaunching again in the fall. So for today's agenda, uh, you know, we're asking this question of why do we need innovations in economic development and where can we find these examples of really uh, promising approaches? Uh, the question we're asking today with today's participant is how do we assure transit accessibility as we convert to decarbonized EVs? Uh, there's a number of issues that come up with the transition over to electric vehicles and decarbonize, decarbonized uh, transportation uh, that aren't out in the broader public policy discourse. So I'm hoping that this can contribute to that, but also help us think about city planning, about economic development and transit policy in general. So today's webinar is gonna be with Moto Co-op CEO, Patrick Dangle. It'll be about 30 to 40 minutes. And at the end, there'll be a question and answer with uh, CEO Nangle. Uh, just so you're aware, our next webinar on housing, which is very relevant everywhere right now, is going to be June 17th, 11.30 a.m. So just a really quick backdrop of uh, UC Cooperative Extension. Uh, we are sort of, uh, we, we break down the ivory tower, so to speak. We go out into California communities, bring the classroom to uh, our stakeholders. We deal with a ton of issues. And uh, often we're known for dealing with ag and food, but we also deal with other issues such as economic development, which is why I am here. And I am Keith Taylor. I am a what's known as a cooperative extension specialist in community economic development. In most other extension systems, I would be called an extension professor. Uh, so what separates me from my professor colleagues on campus is where they teach on the class on the campus. I bring the classroom to California communities. It's a pretty privileged position. I love doing it. And for this Midwesterner, I also get out and travel. I get to see the state of California. Uh, so every experience for me is a great experience in this job. Now, one thing I want to call quick attention to is that you'll notice in this particular series, uh, we don't have diverse representation. And a lot of that is because we attempted to have better representation. Uh, but due to some unforeseen circumstances, we weren't able to deliver on that. Um, we will be changing that up as it comes to the next series uh, in the fall. Uh, but just so you're aware, University of California and UC Davis are engaged in a number of diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, uh, which you'll find right here in this slide. And it will be available online so you can look deeper into this uh, as we work on our diversity, equity, inclusion uh, initiatives. So moving over to the presentation, uh, you know, as we look beyond the pandemic, you know, a number of us are vaccinated, I am, um, we're going to be returning to some sort of no level of normalcy. Uh, one of the things I heard throughout the pandemic is the economy is not going to be the same as it was before. I'm not entirely sure that's true. I think that this conversation around permanent structural change is a little bit uh, overwrought. I think that instead what happened was these um, trajectories we we're already on were moving quicker. Uh, early in the pandemic, you know, we saw a massive drop in GDP and unemployment, and we saw a disruption in the hospitality you're going to keep seeing that in that particular sector as new new entrants come in, as new platforms arise, this sort of thing. Uh, but one of the things that was pretty shocking to a number of us as these uh, layoffs occurred was just how much Wall Street thrived. And I want to give one quick snapshot of how what's relevant here in today's presentation. Tesla. Tesla was seen as sort of this darling of uh, 2020, where its value went up by eight times which is just wild for a new car company. Uh, Tesla's value was more than General Motors and General Motors absolutely delivers more vehicles per year than Tesla does. Uh, the value is around $600 billion. Uh, CEO Elon Musk is worth about 160 billion. I believe he has 20% of all the shares of Tesla. And a Tesla electric vehicle is gonna run you low end about $60,000. Well, if we're going to really be moving toward decarbonized transit and we're going to be using the, uh, the passenger car as part of that strategy, what does it mean if EVs are going to be the $60,000 level? What's it going to do to working class families uh, and uh, their ability to afford these new vehicles coming onto the market? 
I argue that in our economic development toolbox, we keep reaching for the same tools over and over again. And uh, we actually have a ton of tools to uh, play with, but we're not expanding our imagination. And that's why we're doing this series. So example of uh, what it looks like to do economic development in this space when it comes to transportation, car ownership is privileged. Uh, in the United States, we have a bear of a problem trying to get mass transit going. Just look at California passing the uh, bond referendum for high-speed rail. I think we're still sitting on those stacks of cash, uh, and we haven't really done a whole lot to expand the high-speed rail. Being that car ownership is privileged, this is difficult in low- and middle-income families. Uh, they have to bear the burden of buying these new vehicles or upkeeping them along the way. This then undermines mass transit because we're saying, well, why do we have to do mass transit if everybody has a car? And this spills over into other aspects of the economy. Housing costs go up. In places like California, many houses are required to have a garage or a driveway. Apartment buildings, same thing. What if we're able to remove those, remove those costs, and instead build more units on top of that? Uh, land use patterns are also shifted because now we're having to account for the big car along the way. Well, what if instead of getting there via car, we got there via rail, and we're able to use more walkable paths and more bike paths and this sort of thing, and fewer cars along the way. And of course, there's the environmental impact. We're learning a lot about uh, just having tons of cars on the road and what that does. One of the more surprising things to me is reading about um, wetlands near highways and how the rubber coming off of tires is polluting a lot of wetlands. Uh, that's a more recent study. I think it was from last year. Um, so there's just a number of impacts that come out from privileging car ownership. So this particular webinar is part of the series that I mentioned. Uh, we have uh, the uh, final one here in two weeks. So I'm excited today uh, to have our webinar presenter, CEO Patrick Dangle from Moto Car Co-op. I've been paying attention to Moto for years and been really excited to engage. And with me coming out here in 2017, I've been wanting to figure out how it is we can start a dialogue with Moto and how we can try to bring the Moto model to California. So I'm hoping that this is going to be the first of many conversations I have with CEO Nangle. Uh, and I'm hoping that this is going to have some impact uh, in California transportation policy. So with that, I'd like to hand it off to Patrick. So Patrick, on to you. Very good. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, and thank you for this uh, introduction. It was a really nice uh, overview capturing um, a lot of interesting aspects regarding uh, car ownership. And uh, it's a delight to, uh, to speak with your, uh, your uh, participants uh, today. And hopefully we'll have a nice uh, dialogue after I uh, share a few initial thoughts. Let me just um, do a screen share. Okay, there we go. Okay, and let me let me begin by um, acknowledging that I'm joining you from the <clears throat> traditional and unceded territories of the Musque Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, First Nations. Uh, we operate um, our business uh, on their territories. We um, we appreciate and respect the fact that they have cared for this land for a very long time. Cars are harmful uh, to the land, to the environment, and our co-op is very oriented to minimizing and, uh, and eliminating those harms to the absolute extent uh, that we can. So again, thanks for joining today. Um, my, my hope uh, for today is that not only you find this kind of an interesting uh, hour that you spent, but that we will um, encourage um, somebody, maybe some persons, to think about um, starting a cooperative car sharing in your own communities. So let me let me introduce uh, Moto to you, and I, I, maybe I will explain that I joined Moto uh, about five years ago. So still relatively new. We've been around for twenty four years, um, and we are evolving the strategy and and what the current share what the co op is all about. And and we'll I'll go into that in a bit of uh, detail. So we are we are the first uh, car share cooperative in Canada and the largest uh, by quite some measure. We're based in Vancouver, founded in nineteen ninety seven. Today, about uh, 700 vehicles in our fleet. I'll show you where they're distributed in a, in a few moments on a map. We have about, uh, our co-op has about 23,000 uh, members, a bit more. And we have a thousand, a uh, bit over a thousand business accounts. And a business account means that a business joins the co-op and then they register their employees so that they can use uh, the cars, the shared cars on company business during the, the day. The magic of that is 
businesses are using the vehicles quite a bit during um, kind of working hours, Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of thing. And regular people, individuals, families are using the vehicles much more so on the evenings and weekends. So there's a very high complementarity between these, uh, these two kind of uses. We're about 50 people uh, in the co-op doing all kinds of things. We do software development. We do um, take care of the cars, of course, marketing, finance, sort of traditional functional um, uh, activities. Uh, we're owned by the members. So of the 23,000, 24,000 members, half of those are shareholders. And I'll explain kind of what that's all about um, shortly. Uh, so really driven by, by people and the needs of people and not profit. I like to uh, describe us as a not for loss. So we need to make a profit, but we don't have to make a profit to pay shareholders. We need to make enough money so that we can continue to invest uh, in the business, in the technology, in marketing, in, um, in the quality of the vehicles. But there's nothing that we're then paying back to, um, to shareholders and especially if you like um, institutional uh, shareholders. Uh, so we create the, the platform ourselves, the, uh, the car sharing uh, platform, and we license that to a number of car share, other car share operators uh, based in Canada and the United States. So we have uh, several um, or a few uh, car share operators in the US that use our, our platform. And we're really not about using cars. We advocate to people, please you know, walk, use your bike, use transit as first choices. And when you need a car to fill in gaps, because sometimes you need a car, use a shared car. We have, a, we have quite diverse, a bit of a diversity in the fleet. You can see here sort of represented in the, in the photos. So we have bigger vehicles if you want to move stuff, cargo vans and pickup trucks. We have people mover kind of vehicles, SUVs and, and passenger vans. We have a little sporty uh, two-seaters if it's a date night or you just want to get out and, and explore uh, a little bit with the top down and, and loads and loads of uh, regular uh, sedans. And the idea is if you choose to car share and choose not to own a car, you can match the purpose of your trip to the vehicle that you're using. When you buy a vehicle, you have to somehow optimize across all those use cases. And most people tend to overbuy. Therefore, you know, a lot of big vehicles we see out there, big tendency towards SUVs and, and trucks, when, you know, most of the time people don't actually need that. Most people are traveling most often by themselves uh, in the car. So here you can match the, uh, the vehicle to the, to the use case and, and creates a good economies and a reduced environmental uh, impact. So I mentioned the fleet is uh, distributed. So these little red circles correspond to home locations of vehicles. So we are active with our own fleet in the province of British Columbia, the west coast of Canada, just north of California, of course, with a couple of states in between. Uh, we have about 700 vehicles, as I mentioned. We're in 25 municipalities um, across the province. So in the, the main city, the largest city is Vancouver. So we're in Vancouver in a big way. That's where you see the um, biggest concentration on the map. But a lot of other communities out in the in the Okanagan, which is several hours drive from here, it's a winemaking district kind of out in the in the mountains. We're over on Vancouver Island, which is a very large island where the where Victoria, the provincial capital, is located. So we're there, and and if, you know quite a few other places. What I'll draw your attention to on the map is you will see from that that mass of red kind of in the middle of Vancouver, you see some kind of lines that are kind of moving out from that. That's following the major transit lines. So we have a system here called the SkyTrain. So it's a, it's a, it's a commuter uh, rail uh, operation. And these um, clusters of vehicles are following those lines. Along those lines, we tend to find um, density of, uh, of people and, and uh, housing. So a lot of high rises located near SkyTrain stations. So the cars kind of correspond to, uh, to that. We are very focused on, uh, on purpose, you know, why we exist. And this is what you see on this slide. This is a mantra that we use uh, very often. We think about a lot. Purpose before strategy, you know, why, why, what is the strategy meant to achieve? You know, why do we exist? Purpose before strategy, strategy before structure. And we spend a lot of time thinking about the purpose. Uh, we have a board of directors uh, that are elected from amongst the membership. I'm, nine people in the board. So we work on this with them. Why do we exist? How do we frame that? 
And how do we know that we're actually realizing our, our purpose? So the purpose uh, statement that we've uh, evolved and that we're working with, and it's fundamentally true for the last um, 24 years, hasn't really changed a lot, the core purpose, and it shouldn't change a lot. Uh, we, as I mentioned, I joined five years ago and I wanted to be very clear, you know, before doing strategy on, you know, why, why are we here? What are we trying to achieve? And so we did this work uh, at that time. So we capture that. It's a bit of a, uh, I like to describe it as a, as a pyramid. Uh, starts at the community level and moves down to the little bit closer to the uh, individuals and families. So to transform communities, pretty broad, big statement. By connecting people with places. So now we're getting a bit into the transportation mode, moving people around. And then more granularly in a way that's affordable, convenient, inclusive, and sustainable. And these four words is where we focus on um, uh, understanding whether we're realizing our purpose, we have KPIs you know, associated to those and we track kind of how we're doing and seeing if we're, if we're really being becoming affordable or convenient or inclusive uh, or sustainable. Inclusivity has taken on a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot more emphasis in recent times, going back a year or so ago, big events, uh, of course, uh, catalysts starting with what was happening in the United States spread um, all around the world, caused all of us to reflect on um, what we were doing in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we have quite a number of um, initiatives underway currently for that. And so how do we do it? We provide and operate a platform that enables the sharing of vehicles. So you could think in kind of a current parlance, think of us as a so-called uh, platform uh, cooperative. The, the, the essential um, thought is, uh, thousands of people co-owning and sharing hundreds of cars and doing that in a way that's efficient and fair through the use of this uh, digital uh, platform. So the platform is called Engage. Um, you can see some representations of it here. You see a representation of its sort of online incarnation. You see a couple of, um, of uh, shots of the, of the app. Um, the, the platform is designed in-house. We have our own software development team. It's, uh, as you can look at the kind of the screen, the graphics, it's a little bit dated. This is what we call Engage 7. We're currently building Engage 8. So um, using all new uh, software tools and capabilities, we're rewriting it uh, using an agile um, software development process really from the ground up. It's going to be really cool. It'll allow us to do a lot more with our app and uh, create, this will, this will drive um, a number of, of what we're trying to achieve with a very strong emphasis on convenience um, for users. So I wanted to share with you how the basic economics works in this business. Again, hoping somebody will uh, take an interest, somebody that's either with us today or will listen later will take an interest in the idea and think about forming a, um, a car sharing co-op in their own community. So the way it works is members buy $500 worth of shares, um, 50 shares of $10 a par value. And in exchange for being an owner member, they have access to the lowest uh, rates. And I'll come back to the usage fees uh, in a moment. Those shares are redeemable 100% at any time. So if you decide um, the co-op's not working for you or you're moving away somewhere where we're not present or for a lot of different reasons, you just needed to buy a car life change, new job in a, in a remote place, family change, something else, we just give you your $500 back. The $500 never appreciates, so uh, and we don't pay dividends on the $500 or a, a surplus uh, distribution. We really think about return on investment as affordable access to a vehicle. That's what you're getting in exchange for your investment in the, in the co-op. And we're using that money to basically um, fund the acquisition of cars. So as I mentioned earlier, 12,000 plus people that have bought the shares, $500 each, $6 million plus of capital that we use to uh, invest basically in, uh, in vehicles. The alternative to, to joining the other half of the members are paying $6 a month as a, um, as a member fee and slightly higher um, uh, usage fees. The usage fees are based on time and distance. So it's a combination so much per, per hour and so much per kilometer. We're using kilometers in Canada, uh, 1.6 kilometers uh, to the mile. And so it's a combination of that. And why do we do that? We do it because we want, to, um, we want people to pay their fair share of using the vehicle and not more. 
So this allows us to align ourselves pretty closely to the way that we incur costs. We don't want to make it too complicated. We could go into a lot more levels of detail, but we have fixed costs and we have variable costs. And this allows us to get a pretty close alignment to the actual cost incurred when somebody is using a vehicle. So pay your fair share. And then finally, we look, uh, we watch really closely the utilization of cars. So in the transportation world, utilization is a, you know, one of the key metrics. If you have a vehicle, is it getting used? Is it earning revenue? So we looked at booked hours over available hours. A car is available, principal, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks in a year. There's a bit of time out for maintenance and so on. Of the rest of those hours, how many are being booked and how many are being uh, paid for? And finding the right balance between um, enough um, revenue from the vehicle, but utilization that's not so high that cars aren't available when people want to, uh, to use them. And that's, that's kind of the magic of um, making this work and knowing how many cars to, uh, to have in the fleet. There are um, five strategic themes that we work on currently, and I'm going to elaborate on a couple of these in following slides. So first, um, optimizing deployment of vehicles. So simply, you know, having the right vehicle in the right place. We have this variety of uh, vehicles uh, in the fleet. We want to have them in proximity to members where they live or where they work. The idea is to try to replicate what it might have been like if you had your own car and it was just there in your driveway or in your garage or in front of your house on the street. So you don't have to walk too far, a couple, few minutes, three, four, five minutes, have at least a choice of uh, three cars somewhere in that uh, neighborhood and the right kind of cars. So not only sedans, but maybe also a pickup truck or a cargo van or a passenger van, um, that kind of thing. So really strong focus on that. We're very committed to transitioning to zero emission vehicles. We want to do that um, across the fleet by 2030. We keep cars on average for six years. So by 2024, we want to be buying only uh, zero emission vehicles if they're available. You can't buy a, 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 an electric uh, passenger vans right now, for example. We're starting to see some pickup trucks coming to market, um, a few sedans and so on, but a lot more coming online over the course of the next uh, few years. Uh, we focus on what we call member densification. So where we have cars already, how do we attract more members? So that's looking at the utilization of the vehicles. Um, we look, we focus on something called um, car sharing adjacencies. So how do we expand uses of shared vehicles? So again, to drive um, community impact, transformation for communities, and also um, utilization economics. And I'm going to uh, describe um, a couple of those for you in just a moment. And finally, uh, what we call upgrading Moto as a product. So we have these uh, software clients that are using our platform. And how do we um, share other parts of what we do? Contact center, processes, procedures, um, kind of the how-tos of car sharing. How do we make those more widely available? By doing that, forcing ourselves to do that for third parties, it causes us to raise our own game um, as well. Okay, so let me uh, speak to the transition to zero emission vehicles. So we want to do it for a lot of reasons. Environmental impact is a big part of our value proposition. It's a big part of our purpose. It's what our members expect from us. We're, we're uh, slowly but surely introducing zero emission vehicles in the fleet. We have two um, hydrogen fuel cell cars in the fleet. The car in the photo is one of those. Um, and we're pretty likely going to add a few more in the very near future. We're starting to um, see um, uh, fueling stations, hydrogen fueling stations starting to emerge, uh, come online in the region. And also um, battery electric, several uh, a few different kinds of battery electric uh, vehicles, several models. And what we're seeing is that members really like them. They're getting, uh, they're getting used. They're typically a first choice uh, in a neighborhood where they're available. So that's, that's pretty encouraging. Government at all level is looking to, to make uh, transitions in this direction at the municipal, uh, provincial, and federal levels, all kind of, um, of uh, at least a dialogue and some financial support uh, behind that. Making the business cases is a little bit challenging right now uh, without incentives. So we have incentives here and we're working with government to make sure they're uh, more available. And then the whole, um, the whole issue of the charging infrastructure is a bit of a challenge. Um, as you saw, our cars are widely distributed, so the charging infrastructure somehow needs to be distributed, and there's some logistics and economic challenges um, 
there. We created something uh, called the van pool, which is it's a it's a it's a hybrid between car sharing and car pooling. It's to our understanding unique uh, in the world. We're doing this in cooperation with our local transit operator. It's an organization called TransLink. Um, TransLink is wanting to fill the gaps in their fixed route network. They operate buses and this um, train network that I mentioned earlier, um, kind of metro network, uh, if you like. Uh, and so we're working with them and with some local employers to see how we can, during commuting periods, so to work and from work, those kind of two time slots, typically Monday to Friday, how do we dedicate a certain number of vehicles, typically passenger vans, to carpooling? And then the rest of the time, they revert to regular car share vehicles. Evenings, weekends, kind of out there where people live, and then close to the employer site during the day while they're not uh, being used. So really interesting. We've had 10 um, vehicles running in a pilot. It's gone really well. And we're working with um, TransLink right now to um, start to scale this up. So that's, that's pretty exciting and will be fairly uh, transformational, uh, we believe. Uh, the next project I want to share with you is something we call the Shared Mobility Compass Card. So this is a, it's, it's known in the world as Mobility as a Service. MASS is the acronym, M-A-A-S. And we're collaborating again with TransLink, so the transit operator, local transit operator, also with um, the local bike share operator, it's called Mobi, and also with another car share operator called Evo. So we operate a, a type of car share that we call a round trip. So you use the vehicle, you can take it for as long as you like, you can travel anywhere in Canada and USA for more or less as many days, hours or days as you like, just bring it back where you got it. Uh, Evo operates a different model, which is a more constrained sort of geography. They call that the home zone, and it's a, a one-way car share. So you can pick it up at point A within that zone, drop it off at point B, walk away. Typically, people are using those cars for 30 or 40 minutes for those short commutes, where people are using our cars for three, four, five hours or several days. So it's, it's complementary. So the four of us are um, collaborating on this uh, shared mobility compass card. Compass card is the local transit card. It's what you see here in the photo. Um, we ran already a business to business pilot. This special card was made for that. We had uh, about uh, 14 companies with their employees. They registered their employees. We gave them these cards. We let that run for quite a period of time. We got a lot of data, a lot of feedback, very encouraged. We just won a, a national award called the uh, Clean 50 Top Project. So uh, it's actually 24 projects across the country that were recognized for um, contribution to um, environmental harm reduction and doing something beneficial for the community and something to watch and that can be replicated kind of uh, elsewhere. So we're pretty excited about this. The phase two pilot, we're just working through the details right now, should launch in September. This will be a consumer pilot, so regular people using these uh, various modes and interconnecting between the modes all using a single card and a single uh, payments infrastructure. And we will uh, launch the pilot with uh, 12 or 1300 participants, um, as I said, starting in, in uh, September. So we're very excited uh, about that. This, will, this should really help to make shared mobility fly and create even more reason and convenience for people not to need to own and use um, their own car. So I also wanted to touch on why uh, co-op is a good business model for car sharing. Now, it's a very strong uh, value proposition. I, I, hope you've, I hope you've realized that uh, until now, but maybe to note that you know, if, you, um, if you own your own car, it's pretty expensive. Different automobile associations make calculations. Uh, in US dollars, it's you know, depending on the car you have and different circumstances, cost of insurance and such, cost of fuel, plus or minus $8,000 a year. Our average member is spending uh, less than $1,000 a year with us. So the affordability and the economics are very, very uh, favorable for individuals and for families. And it's part of why we exist to, to allow this kind of uh, affordability. Um, as mentioned already, you know, our model is thousands of people that co-own and share hundreds of cars and pay their fair share and nothing more than that. It's kind of as simple as, uh, as that. Um, we're a local player. We're really invested in the local community. We're committed to be there through good times and bad. Um, we've been at it for 24 years. Just for information, because some of you might be familiar with uh, Zipcar, 
big operator, uh, started in the United States in the Boston area, operating around the world, much bigger than Moto. Uh, when the pandemic hit early in 2020, they just pulled up and left Vancouver, just like that, with 10 days uh, notice to members. Um, pretty astounding uh, from our point of view. We would never do this. We're in this community where we've got deep roots in the community and we're, we're here to stay. And that's what co-ops kind of generally are all about. And all the, all the earnings, everything that we earn is reinvested into the co-op. Nothing is leaving the, uh, the community. And so finally, um, just you know, kind of for your consideration, a um, few things I, I would like you to ask yourself and think about if you think there might be um, interest for this kind of uh, activity in your own community. You know, are the people in your community uh, concerned about issues of affordability and environmental income? impact. Vancouver is a very expensive place to live. It's probably one of the most expensive in the world. People are really squeezed. People aren't earning more income, but the cost of housing is going up. For most people, costs related to transportation come second in terms of demand after housing. So, you know, the cost to buy a car, the cost to insure it, the cost to maintain it, the cost to fuel it, maybe parking in some cases. So making some uh, movement there can be uh, really uh, helpful. Um, do you enjoy a robust uh, public transit system? Keith spoke about uh, public transit in the US and lack of funding. Uh, I, I feel your pain where I think we're in a bit of a better situation here. Car sharing works really well. Our form of car sharing works really well. If you can get where you need to go most days, so for most people that's to work or to, uh, or to school, uh, using transit or your bike or walking. If that's the case, you really don't need a car because you're not using the car that much. A few, a few percent of the hours that you actually are paying to own that car, you're actually using it on maybe evenings and weekends. So car sharing could be a really good fit. Transit, good transit is, uh, is really pretty fundamentally important to car sharing thriving uh, in a community. Uh, does your vehicle or the vehicle of people in your community sit idle 95% of the time? That's by far the most, um, the most common situation and you're paying this $8,000 a month, how good a value proposition is that? Ask yourself. And finally, is there an opportunity in your community for cooperative car sharing? If there is, um, as said, we're helping a number of, uh, of um, other organizations to get there. In Canada, those that are uh, using our platform are also co-ops. Uh, in the US, they're not-for-profits. There's a couple of them in New York State. There's a couple of them in uh, Colorado. And, um, and we would be open to supporting um, others. So with that, I'm going to stop the monologue. Uh, what I look forward to is understanding what you, what you care about, what uh, interests you. I'll be happy to answer any questions of any kind and I'll stop the, uh, the screen share there. Uh, thank you for that, Patrick. Man, you know, whenever I hear about Moto, I'm always going, <laughs> I want one of these in my own backyard because right now I'm, sit I'm sitting on a 2012 Toyota Prius and I've got, uh, you know, kind of car buying anxiety. Do I go in right now and get something that's affordable and newer, knowing that internal combustion engines might be going away here in the next couple of years? Or do I pay for an EV? Do I wait on it? I wouldn't have to worry about these things if I had a car share that was meeting my needs in this region. Um, so before we hop into the Q&A, I just want to you know, make sure the audience is aware. In two weeks, we have Michaela Fenton. Uh, she's going to be talking about her work around uh, workforce housing. Uh, we know that housing has become a major issue, not only in California, uh, but in other parts of the country. I can tell you, uh, for example, my hometown, uh, Mattoon, Illinois, uh, kind of the median housing price I recall was about 85000 at the start of the pandemic. And I think it's at 120000 which is just wild. <laughs> Uh, so we need to be looking at different models for how we're doing housing for sure. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop the screen share and we're going to do a Q&A here with uh, Patrick. I, I, I want to start off though with, um, we got Rich Morris asking a question and I, I want to frame it up a little bit uh, and then go into what Rich is asking. And that's first, you know, Patrick, you'd mentioned uh, Moto has its platform that other places can use. And then you'd also mentioned that Zipcar had left. So First thing I, I would like to request is if you could talk about kind of like the world of car share that's out there. Uh, I don't think people are aware that there's other car share co-ops in Europe predominantly from what I understand. So it'd be great if you could kind of elaborate on that. And then to Rich Morris's question of why do you think Zipcar left so suddenly? If you can talk about that as well. 
Sure. Um, so, uh, so first about car sharing co-ops generally. So this concept um, originated in Europe, in Switzerland, about 50 years ago. So there's, uh, it was, there was a couple of car share operators that you know, over time merged. And so the system, the, the organization that operates today, it's called Mobility. And they're operating all over Switzerland. They're very working very closely with the uh, transit systems, either in municipalities and the national uh, rail network, um, in order to kind of integrate mobility and uh, and have this kind of seamless movements between, say, using the train or using the bus, and then into uh, into a shared car. Went pretty quickly from there into Germany, and so there's several operators around there, and now all across Europe, in France, in the UK. In the UK, they call them car clubs not car sharing. Uh, you see that in Scandinavia and so on, and, and here and there um, around the world. A uh, big operator in uh, Australia, uh, for example, uh, a couple of big operators in, uh, in Australia. Uh, here in Canada, there's another large operator, good friend of ours uh, in uh, Montreal, based out of Montreal called Communato, um, and they're operating in kind of Eastern Canada in, in different places. Uh, in the US, um, Zipcar has tended to, uh, to dominate. They were, uh, Pretty aggressive. They they belong to um, Avis Budget today, so they were independent to start with. Never a co-op, uh, independent to start with. Bought by Avis Budget, um, pretty big. Um, so why why did they leave? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I, I I mean they don't didn't say really, except one assumes it has to do with the economics, and that's an advantage that we have. You know we don't need to make we don't need to pay Avis Budget shareholders a dividend. You know, we're just investing, you know, what we earn into the community. So our threshold for earnings is very different, right? And the, the algorithm, right? And the, you know, what's, what's getting made, the decisions being made in a boardroom far away by people that are maybe three steps removed from the business. You know, if you're a, a, a director of Avis Budget, you're probably not looking, you know, maybe as closely at the car share operation in Vancouver. So, um, so a lot of contributing factors. I'll mention as well that uh, another organization um, participants might be familiar with is car to go So car to go uh, it belongs to Daimler. So think Mercedes-Benz out of Germany. Uh, they were in the one-way car share business. Um, they established themselves in a pretty significant way uh, across Europe and, and really big in the United States. Uh, they pulled out of North America at around the same time, um, right around the start of the pandemic. They had not announced it earlier in December and that was clearly about the economics. They just couldn't find a way to kind of make that uh, work. So it, it's a bit challenging. You know, if you're in it for the money, it's going to be hard. If you're in it for, you know, the community and for people, um, it's absolutely doable. So that's, uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Fantastic. You know, so Patrick, uh, Kit Sanders asked a, a great question. How well would the, how well would this work in a rural county? And, um, there's a lot of things which I think are some interesting parallels to the American electric cooperative sector. So two weeks ago, we had Kevin Short with Anza Electric and he presented. And uh, what happened was the investor owns didn't want to come to rural areas because of the low margins. It's, it, they'll say up front that it's about we can't be profitable, but it's not about that. It's not profitable enough is the issue. Um, you know, so with that, you know, obviously a zip car would love to go to a San Francisco or a Los Angeles, New York City, these kind of denser areas. Uh, but these sparser areas, it seems like structurally there's going to be some challenges. Can you talk a little bit about that, of, of uh, Moto's considerations with rural and what you know from the industry, what folks are talking about in that space? Sure. So um, virtually all of our um, software clients, those other car share operators that are using our platform are small much smaller. The next largest, as I said, we're about six, 700 cars. Um, the next closest is in Canada, it's in Winnipeg, Manitoba, about 60 cars. But we have, we have a lot of, a few of them, a lot, a few of them that are like in single digits. They have four cars or six cars or eight cars or 15 cars. Hmm. And so they're relatively small. Uh, the challenge is you have to, um, you have to figure out how to support that network. So, so having, you don't want to make your own software application. So having kind of the platform available is helpful. Um, some of them do that with um, boards, you know, volunteer boards. So it's a group of people. What, what you really need to establish is um, that you have a need in your community and there's a group of people that want to participate. 
right? and and will actually use the cars, not just participate because they want to support co-ops and they buy some shares, but they never use the cars. That's not helpful. You know, there needs to be a real sort of underlying need and people are going to use the cars. And then where do you put the cars? And we typically, we think in terms of a kind of a triangles. So you want to have at least three cars, right? Because then, and, and, a, and a cluster of, of users that are in proximity to those three cars. Because, you know, if one or two cars is being used by somebody else, you know, and you need a car, you want to have one available. So if you only have one car, it doesn't work. Or, or they're so, you know, dispersed that you can't easily get to, you know, the second or the third car. So think about, you know, kind of starting with three, and then you branch out from there. We started, by the way, um, you know, we, we started 24 years ago. It was a thesis project by a, a then young lady at one of the local universities. And she started, she felt a need. As she looked at what was going on in Europe, she brought that idea here, she elaborated on it, she decided to actually do it. She started with two cars and 16 members. And so we've just kind of grown steadily. It was pretty manual, right, uh, at the time. It was only later that we started to introduce, uh, you know, more technology, more automation, you know, kind of smoother uh, operational uh, approach. The technology is available kind of now to open the cars remotely and all that kind of thing. So you don't need to start big, um, but you need to be committed. Uh, what we found here is um, we we had more software clients before. Some of those in our local area in British Columbia have at a certain point said, you know what, um, maybe we should join Moto now. So those that have been a little bit more uh, remote from Vancouver, um, they started you know, themselves locally with a board, hiring somebody if they needed to, or the board doing some of the work, cleaning the cars, getting it repaired, that kind of thing. And then eventually hiring an employee. And so we, we merged those over time into Moto. There is absolutely a benefit to having a um, sort of a more significant, there's, there's a, you know, economies of scale to having a larger operation. And that's where the, I mentioned earlier, kind of Moto as a product, how can, we're, we're, we're thinking about how can we kind of share some of our scale economies beyond just the software platform. Um, and so that's kind of a still a work in progress. Well, I'm interested in that piece too, Patrick, because there's almost a, um, public policy seems to have really played a nice role uh, in terms of how you're able to achieve economies of scale. And uh, it, I'd be interested in you talking more about the partnerships that you have around the Vancouver community broadly, um, how you're able to allow for cost sharing and savings uh, through these public policy initiatives, but also how you're able to help out with other public institutions and their fleet needs too. Right, so so really great, uh, really great question. And there's a number of, of um, of uh, collaborations that we work on uh, locally. Probably the, the two most important collaboration partners are the municipalities and the public transit system. And I spoke to the public transit system already. So, so let me talk about municipalities. So we very early on worked with the, the city of Vancouver to start with and then you know, the other municipalities where we're operating to um, integrate uh, into their so-called transportation demand management policies. How we, how we get support for car sharing as new multi-unit residential buildings are being um, erected. So as part of the process, if you're a developer, real estate developer, and you wanna put up a you know, high rise residential building, right, which eventually would be um, maybe sold as condos or, um, or used as a rental building, to get your, your development permit, there's a three-way kind of relationship, if you like, between the developer, the municipality and Moto that they have to integrate a, a shared car into the building. So what that means is they will fund the car. Um, they will provide parking. We will make an agreement with them that the city will then uh, approve. And then, you know, typically those big projects take a couple of years, two, three years. When the building is ready for occupancy, then we, uh, the money gets moved, the car gets installed into the parking spot. And that car isn't just available for people in the building. We do, we do a lot marketing to people in the building and, and kind of incentives to join and use the cars, but it's really a community amenity. So it's serving the whole community kind of around that neighborhood. And so access to the building and so on is all kind of uh, something we take into account. We're in, we're in well over a hundred such buildings now. We have a pipeline, you know, if we're looking over the development, there's a lot of development going on in this area. Uh, we've got more than a hundred sort of other developments kind of in the pipeline that we have visibility to at various stages today. This is really important because it supports the economics. That kind of contribution um, supports the economics. The other thing we do with municipalities is um, they are pretty often our largest business account. 
So the city of Vancouver um, has is, is a business account. They've registered a thousand municipal employees to use moto cars during the course of the working day. So they have, they have some of their own fleet cars. These are kind of ad hoc cars. They're not dedicated sort of work vehicles of the city, but they're the ad hoc kind of the pool cars, if you like. So they have, they have a few that's kind of covers their base demand. And we actually install our in-vehicle technology into their, their cars, says city of Vancouver on the site. And so they can reserve those cars using our platform. Plus they can reserve any of the other moto cars. So to fill up the kind of the peaks of demand, excess demand. So when their own cars aren't available. And so that, that works um, really well. We have a lot of cars located near city hall or near the works yards. And so we're doing that with several municipalities. Vancouver is the biggest one, but we're doing that with several municipalities. And so what that means is we can afford, that it, it, it brings a cost savings to them and a, and a convenience, kind of an efficiency. They don't have to worry about kind of key exchange. There's a system for how people can access reserve and access their cars. Um, but it also provides a base of revenue on the vehicles that allows us to have more vehicles available for citizens that are kind of living in those sort of same areas. So it's really mutually uh, beneficial and has been pretty fundamental to our growth and success. I'm just curious uh, on that, Patrick, are there any estimates as to um, what kind of savings you're able to offer these public agencies with these contracts? Yeah, I, we're not privy to that. Um, they, they will certainly make their own uh, calculations. Uh, they typically come out as a, as a tender. So we bid on those. Uh, we give them, you know, preferred pricing, of course. Uh, they're big volume uh, users. Um, but yeah, no, we're not privy to their own economic uh, calculation. They, they keep doing it. So I assume it's, uh, it's favorable. And, and they take into account, you know, I mean, the economics is clearly important, but they fully recognize, you know, the benefit to the community. And, and supporting that is also pretty important to them. So there's just a number of things that Moto has done over the years where there's this uh, amazing patchwork of policies and strategy, tactics, I should say, within the broader strategy of you know, being this purpose-driven organization. Um, was this at the inception or is it one of those things where it's just you iterate as time goes on and you discover these new opportunities? It's, it's evolved over time. I mean, the, the starting point was you know, 16 people that uh, you know, didn't want to or couldn't afford to own a car but needed to use one once in a while probably to go skiing or to go hiking or something like that, get out of the city. So kind of started like that, affordability and reduced environmental impact. And then it's just over the years, you know, as we've, as we've grown, as we've, um, you know, brought on uh, more members and, you know, understand what their needs are and, and through discussions with the cities as a policy, you know, municipal intent, Vancouver sort of, uh, pitches itself as a you know, greenest city, has a, has a pretty uh, significant sort of environmental strategy. Um, and so you know, we align uh, with that. And hence, hence the, um, you know, I mentioned you know, completely uh, zero emission vehicles by 2030. That's also coming from the city. You know, they said in their planning, they want fleets like ours, taxis and ride hailing and, and such kind of uh, fleets to be zero emission by 2030. Oh, fantastic. You know, so you're talking about um, that sort of thousand dollar price tag per year for a family that wants to use Moto. And, you know, if I'm looking at a Tesla, let's say, uh, I think that I priced it out and it's something like $600 a month, actually 650 if you just buy it on the basic terms over seven years. And uh, so 600 times 12, that's, you know, $7,200, you know, back the envelope. So there's significant savings here, especially as Moto starts moving more into EVs and you know, me might have like one or two Teslas, but there's probably gonna be other EVs other than Tesla in the moto fleet. Um, do you have a, a other, may, maybe not studies, but anecdotes uh, of how this has improved quality of life for the everyday consumer that uses a uh, moto co-op? Um, so we do a lot of surveys with members to try to understand, you know, what's important to them, the benefit, you know, how much they're saving and so on. So it's, it's, we believe it's pretty significant. We think it's one of the affordability is one of the biggest drivers. As I mentioned earlier, you know, cost of housing here is crazy. Um, you know, young people who can afford to buy a house, who can get the down payment to start with, let alone you know finance a, a mortgage. And so you have to you have to find some space uh, somewhere else. So we think that's a really big driver. And then you you match that up with uh, you know happily uh, you know ever increasing awareness of environmental impact, and people want to to figure out you know how they can how they can do something about that. 
And I, I just want to I just want to make a comment about you know your own thoughts and and you I don't talk just about you but people you know wanting now to exchange their um, internal combustion engine vehicle for an electric. If we do that one-to-one, -one, if you look at the whole fleet of vehicles out there, right, and we convert those all to electric, it will be an absolute environmental disaster that we probably can't imagine. You know, if you think about, you know, what's needed in those vehicles, lithium for the batteries and the copper and all the other rare earths and all the other, um, you know, um, uh, metals uh, that are needed, the amount of mining we're going to have to do worldwide is going to have to increase by, you know, a factor of, X, four or five, six times more than we're doing today. I mean, that's not supportable. It's absolutely not supportable. The only, the only path to um, a better sort of uh, future is yes, zero emission vehicles, but zero emission vehicles that are shared, right? So that we have a lot fewer vehicles on the road at the end of the day. We don't need that many vehicles. Autonomous, when, when, when and if autonomous uh, technology arrives, it'll make it a lot easier. There will be no good reason to own your own car because the car could literally, you know, be at your front door just when you need it and bring it back to your front door. You don't even have to walk these three, 400 uh, meters maybe. That will be, we're not quite there yet, but that's uh, certainly uh, coming. But um, but yeah, there's a lot of things that kind of um, conspire, but we're seeing, we've been seeing pandemic last year aside, which was really an anomaly. We've been seeing growth in membership running in the sort of 10 to 15% a year. So pretty, pretty healthy growth year over year. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so uh, Patrick, we got Rich Morris asking a question, um, and, and I'll tee this up. One of the things that folks have talked about, that there's controversy around Uber and Lyft models uh, and how they treat their workers. Uh, that's really picked up during the pandemic, and you know, there's all these viral videos of people getting upset wearing their masks and safety, guarantee the drivers and all that. Uh, but recently, uh, there's also been a lot of press coverage around a new um, uh, model out of uh, New York City, where it's a worker-owned co-op that's basically for cabs. And it makes great sense. Uh, so Rich, you know, I'm presuming that Rich is asking in this vein, have you ever thought about offering way people can hire a driver in the car uh, on top of the mo uh, moto model? We, we won't go there. Um, there are so many issues with that that we um, don't like. And first, I, I just want to say, um, they, they often brand themselves as ride sharing. Um, it's not, there's nothing kind of sharing going on. There is real ride sharing. Ride sharing means you're going from A to B and you take somebody along with you, right? And they maybe share something of the cost. Um, you know, this is, this is ride hailing. Uh, it's in my interpretation, it's a form of taxi with cool um, technology. So I think they, they really um, co-opted the sharing expression. And uh, those of us that are in the true sharing economy are really uh, not very happy with that. But I, I would say beyond the, the worker um, issue, there is, there is a fact and there's some really good academic studies being done, including uh, you know, in New York City and, and other places in the US and, and internationally, that shows that you know, ride hailing just introduces a lot more vehicle traffic, um, you know, vehicle miles traveled into the streets because mm -hmm. those drivers that are chauffeuring people around, right, for, uh, for price, they're also in motion when they don't have somebody in the car, right? They're kind of moving around. So you end up actually with more vehicles on the street than before. I'm not, that's, there's a lot of academic study. Uber and Lyft try to refute those every time they come out, just like they do with the uh, the worker wages. But I think, you know, good um, independent studies um, sort of uh, show that. We, we asked our members, because we thought, so maybe we could make our cars. A lot of, a lot of ride hailing, a ride hailing kind of has a peak of demand um, during commuting periods. Oh, so yeah. getting to and from work, people looking for a chauffeur to take them to work or back and ready to pay that. And then also Thursday, Friday, Saturday evenings, kind of, you know, let's go out, let's have some drinks, let's not drive, which is great, get a ride home. And so in that part of it, I really appreciate, just like taxi. And so we thought, well, our cars are less busy during those times. Maybe our members could use our cars to do these kind of services to earn some income for ourselves. And so the co-op, we went out to our members and we said, what do you think? And they gave it a, like a very strong thumbs down, said, this is not our purpose. We don't want to be in that business. Um, so we're not. Great. Um, one last question here before we wrap up, Patrick. I, I'm curious, uh, you know, here it is. Uh, you operate a big fleet. I think you said, how many cars was it again? About 700. 700. 
So, uh, you know, that's going to require a lot of fuel. And uh, we're moving away from the, you know, internal combustion engine and away from fuel over time. I know we're not there yet. Um, but here soon, this means that we're going to be talking to our utility providers, our electric utility providers. And one of the things when you talk with uh, executives like Curtis Wynn with Roanoke Electric Cooperative, he talks about the peaks and valleys and demand, right? And sort of similar to transportation, like what you're saying. Um, are there opportunities here for these fleets to go out and negotiate uh, favorable rates on fuel uh, with fuel providers? And currently that would be gas, but as time goes on with our electric utilities. Yeah, so um, so our pricing is is all in, so it includes a fuel. Every car has a has a fuel card in it. Um, part of being in the co-op is you have a responsibility to leave some fuel in the car for the next person. We ask for at least a quarter of a tank, so people are used to doing that. We don't. Uh, our volume isn't big enough to extract like really interesting uh, discounts. We don't buy sort of fuel futures. We don't have a storage space uh, for that. We have quite a number of uh, fuel stations, different brands, if you like, that people can go to and use so that it's convenient. There's fewer and fewer fuel stations around, um, especially in the in the city center. So we want to give people a choice. So so we haven't done that. Fuel prices, nobody can predict tomorrow's fuel prices. So if you lock it in, you might lose anyway. Um, so we just kind of, you know, work with what's kind of current. I do think we have we have here coming to Canada. It's already in place in BC, has been for a while. It's going to be uh, more prevalent across the country, carbon pricing. So one can well imagine that's going to ratchet up over time. Um, not far enough in my point of view, but it's it's at least something. And uh, so that we will undoubtedly see an increase in fuel prices. So what we do, part of the reason to move to zero emission vehicles sooner rather than later is a hedge against future uh, fuel prices. And so we're also introducing, it's hard, there's some issues, some obstacles around electric vehicles right now, fully electric. So we're introducing in the meantime, at least more hybrids to reduce the fuel consumption per vehicle or per unit of distance, miles, per kilometer. Um, regarding, regarding electricity, and this is, this is a really big challenge. Um, I, I can't imagine that we could have a forest of you know, individual charging stations matched one-to-one -one with vehicles. That just seems nightmarish uh, to me. Having, having you know, fast chargers, uh, so-called DC fast chargers that are kind of uh, replicating fuel stations as we know them today. So you have places to go, plug in very quickly, kind of charge up your car or charge it up enough and then get on your way would seem a really good fit. And I think uh, you know, energy providers, um, depending on the structure you know, between you know, producing and transmission and then kind of retailing you know, what that looks like in any jurisdiction, I think there's a really big role to play here in making that happen. Fuel stations, uh, the fuel companies, as we know today, are not stepping up to it. I mean, it almost doesn't exist. Um, so we can look forward to that. I mentioned we have a couple of uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So this is electric that, you know, the fuel cell is creating the electricity in the car using the hydrogen. And um, so you can go to a hydrogen fuel station, you can plug in the car and in four minutes, you can put in 600 kilometers of range. It's magic. This is perfect. We just don't have enough fuel stations so that there's enough sort of places to go. There's not enough uh, range. If we had a network of such stations or or electricity that could replicate, you know, that quick quick uh, charge and uh, off you go, that would be the best case in my opinion. Wow. Well, Patrick, you know, we're we're up on time. Uh, this is a phenomenal webinar. I'm excited to get this out in the wild and see how other folks respond to this. But really grateful for your time and uh, hope that you enjoyed uh, participating in this. Yes, so, uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, so thanks again, Patrick, and thanks to uh, all of our attendees as well. Uh, and uh, look for the next webinar coming up here in two weeks with Michaela Fenton. So thank you all and bye-bye.